the three cells is designed to get them interested in potentially buying, to share content that they will find valuable about an experience that they are having and to introduce the product lineup. It's not to sell the product. It's to just ping their interest and be like, oh, this is cool, this, oh, this for these products. And then if they click through, sweet, now you're selling them. Or if they don't, you're retargeting them. All right. Hello, everyone. The Robust Marketer here with a very special uh, episode. I'm really excited uh, to have Molly Pittman as well as eventually Ezra Firestone. He's stuck in traffic as well. Um, <laughs> but these two superstars are presenting at both Affiliate World Europe and Facebook and e-commerce Mastery Live. Uh, we're doing something a little different with Ezra and Molly this time where we're bringing them on stage together for a live hot Ooh. seat where you will get the chance to get your uh, at your, you know, your traffic problem solved by, by these two amazing professionals. So I'm really excited for that. We've never done anything like that at one of our events. We've always saved that kind of stuff for the, the, the speaker's dinner and things like that. But I'm excited for the brave souls who are willing to get up there and, uh, and, and jump on stage with us. So welcome to the podcast, Molly. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. And hello to everybody listening. Really excited for Barcelona. I always love uh, presentations, or I guess you call them experiences. They're more so experiences where we can actually bring people up and solve problems uh, versus a traditional presentation. So we are pumped and I cannot wait. Hope to see you guys uh, in Barcelona. That's awesome. Well, today we're going to be talking about a lot of things. I'm just excited to, this is the first time I've actually met Molly, we were just saying. Uh, so just to discuss uh, sort of her history and her, her hero's journey, I'm really excited to get into that. Um, but first, you should also know that we are down to our final few tickets at uh, Facebook and e-commerce Mastery Live. This thing will sell out like most of our events do. Uh, and just today for the rest of this week, you can use AdLeaks25 as a promo code to get 25% off this week. Uh, the prices are going up weekly, but you're still getting the days for an incredibly cheap price compared to the value you're gonna get. So come join us in Barcelona. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. And remember, this is a live broadcast. So any questions that you have, you can just throw them below. Uh, we will get to them during the podcast. And if we don't, we will uh, address them after the fact. So, all right, Molly, let's just jump into it here. I know uh, I know the outline of your story, I think, just from following you for many years now. But why don't you tell us your hero's journey? How did you get started? And tell us tell us about, about it a little bit. Awesome. Short version or long? No. <laughs> Me medium. Give, give medium, me the medium story. Okay. So uh, a few details. No, uh, I, I love telling my story because hopefully it is inspirational to some of you guys listening. Um, but I got into digital marketing now about eight years ago and I grew up in Kentucky. I was a bartender. I worked at a bourbon distillery and I moved to Austin, Texas because I wanted to be in the spirits industry. Uh, marketing or sales or something of that nature. And so I moved down to Austin and no one would hire me. <laughs> I couldn't get a job. And so I found on Craigslist this really funny, interesting ad about um, a digital marketing internship that they were going to hire 15 people and take us through a three month process. And in the end, a few people would get a full time position. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. Uh, so I went, I interviewed, I think we started like two days later. Um, and it was with a company called Idea Incubator, which was owned by Ryan Dice and Perry Belcher, Richard Linder, the guys that own Digital Marketer now. And so I was lucky enough to be hired um, after this internship program. They had us um, like come up with fictitious business plans and then pitch them to the company. Um, I knew nothing about digital marketing. I didn't even own a laptop at the time. <laughs> uh, I, I d had no concept of, of digital marketing at all. And so they were really looking for who could do research, who you know could possibly be a public speaker, like who could figure this stuff out because it's all new. Um, and we created business plans for businesses we ended up starting over the years, which is kind of funny. Like if you've ever followed Digital Marketer, you've probably heard us talk about Survival Life or some of the brands that they've started over there. So that's the, those were the business plans that uh, that we got to create, and they were terrible. <laughs> they were so bad. Um, um, but anyways, I was lucky enough to be hired full time. And then I was placed 
Um, that's when digital marketers started as a brand. And so I was placed on that team. I was like the third or fourth person there. And at first I just did whatever I could to help <laughs> because I, di I didn't really have a skill set. So um, I was doing organic social media. Uh, this is actually when I met Ezra. So Ezra did his first product. He did a launch with digital marketer called Brown Box Formula back in 2012. And so I like built the membership site and optimized press. So uh, I built the little community and Ming. So I was just trying to help um, however I could. But my interest really, the organic social media stuff very much got me interested in, in buying media and especially Facebook ads. So I went to, to Ryan, my boss at the time, and um, he didn't have a media buyer. And I said, hey, give me a shot. You know, I, I, I want to try this. So he bought a few courses. I, I can't remember. It was like Justin Brooke and like a few people yep. who have been doing this a long time. And he gave me like a thousand bucks and he said, go run some ads and bring me back more money than, um, than you spent. And of course, it was a different landscape back then. It was a bit easier to just throw up some ads <laughs> and make some money. Uh, but it worked out. And from there, um, I think, uh, to date, I've spent about $15 million on the platform. And um, I ended up becoming the VP of marketing at Digital Marketer, so built out a team. Um, and when I left there about a year and a half ago, we had uh, a little over 70 employees, I think, at the time. So Amazing. I was able to watch that grow, learn from some incredibly intelligent people. Um, I got to you know, learn to speak on stage and share my knowledge, which is what I really love to do now. Um, so now I still run ads for a few clients, but most of my time is spent on um, a few products that Ezra and I have that are our training products. So uh, training people how to become media buyers. We also also have a membership uh, for more advanced media buyers to give you know up to date information every month. Um, I also have a podcast called Perpetual Traffic. Uh, but yeah, that's that's my journey, and uh, I never intended to really get into this stuff, but I'm so glad that I did. And I think my story is a testament to wherever you are, uh, things can change really quickly. And these skills can be acquired uh, very quickly as long as you're willing to evolve and be open to the changes and everything that comes with what we do. So yeah, thanks, yeah. thanks for letting me tell that. That's all what, yeah, that's totally what we're about as well. And I love you, you followed a, a similar path to me in some ways in that, you know, a lot of people, I come from the affiliate space. And so a lot right. of the mindset there is, you know, in your basement, pounding away, running offers, things like that. You've kind of come at it in a, in a, in a way where you started with digital marketer, which was this mm -hmm. incredible growth startup. Uh, yeah. That was you still in the space, so you grew. You're able to grow with them, and then sort of go out on your own after the fact. After you kind of built up your your sort of position, which is a very similar path to mine, actually. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, and I appreciate that experience because I do know what it's like to work for someone else. I think that's important perspective as you start to grow your own business or whatever your journey is, versus you know starting as the entrepreneur. It, it's a very different experience, but I'm very grateful that I had had that experience. Nice. Okay. Well, now that we're getting into some team training here, let's bring the rest of our A team in. Uh, so we are notifying our guests. BeLive.tv really is a great piece of software. I got to say hello, yes, Ezra awesome. Firestone. Hey, I'm here. How are you doing, brother? How are you? I'm excellent. Did you, were you going home or to the office? I, was, I'm, I am on West 3rd in New York City. Um, nice. I like to, I do, you know, sometimes I have have meetings check that out that's west third out there oh dang that's some coconut water and uh <laughs> For that's bears. west third um yeah west fourth is where the legendary basketball um tournaments happen at this court on west fourth i'm right around the corner from there dr um, j washington square park with the with the washington square park with the arches and uh, the comedy cellar and mcdougall street where, where you'll get your money taken in a chess game it's cool Unreal. Uh, so I'm anyways, just happy that you're wearing I, a I shirt. Yeah, so <laughs> I saw another you interview. Know, listen, <laughs> hey, you know, part of the um, the value and benefit that you get from uh, working from home is you can wear whatever is most comfortable. And it got hot in New York recently. So yeah. I had to go shirtless. Hey, you got to do um, what it anyways, takes. I'm happy to be here. I heard your, your interview there, Molly. And I just wanted to add. 
uh, that in addition to everything that you've been doing on the education side, you have been very um, influential in the paid ad strategy for Boom, Smart Marketer, and Zipify, which are my three companies. So you're still doing it, you know? Yeah, out there we doing it. it. Thank we don't you work for with that. people who aren't doing it at this point. <laughs> so that's that's, that's definitely, a good way to be. Yeah, definitely. Well, well, this is so awesome to have you both here. So talk a little bit about how you decided to work together and, and really, you know, it's funny because I've run so many different kinds of courses. The first course that we ever ran was a very similar, I think, to, to what you guys are doing, except it was for affiliate marketing. So it was very, but it was all about setting foundations. It was a cohort based class. So it took place over time with, with people there to support you as you're going. We only ran it a few times a year. It was our most successful course, basically. And so it's interesting to see you guys have, have taken a kind of similar model that appears to be paying dividends. Tell me a little bit about how it came together. Can I do this part, Molly? You, you do it, as Okay, so, um, you know, I have been in the education space since, since the first course I ever launched, which was 20, end of 2012, I think, that Molly and I worked on together at Digital Marketer. It was called the Brown Box Formula. And since that time, I never wanted to be a, I never had the idea that I would be an educator in this space. It just kind of happened and I'm really happy that it did. But since that time, I've been doing um, a lot of trainings for e-commerce business owners and always the most popular topic is traffic. It's, it's been that way from forever and it maintains to be that way. No matter what people, even though there are, there are topics that are, in my opinion, just it's the easiest lever to pull in a yeah, way, right? I think that's why people like it. Covered carrot. The, the other stuff it, is the chocolate covered carrot. Yeah, so I, got, that's right. I have this. Uh, I have this analogy that my wife really doesn't it would prefer me to have a new one, but it's the only one. It's, it just fits. It's called the chocolate covered carrot, which is we get people's attention with chocolate, which is traffic, and then we feed them their vegetables, which is communication and team building and project management and email marketing and conversion optimization. You know what I mean? Like that's the carrot part. But the point is that we've always done traffic as like kind of our leading product that we sold in the uh, education space in that it's the one that everyone's the most interested in. And we have a lot to say about it. And over the years, my role in our companies has uh, changed. And in the last two years in particular, I have found it very hard to maintain the education side where I'm producing tons of content and courses on what I'm doing and also the CEO side where I'm literally running all the businesses. And so uh, through my mastermind, Blue Ribbon, I still get the joy of documenting what's working for me and sharing it. And Molly is for sure the best paid traffic Facebook educator in the game. Like she is incredible. She has passion. She's been doing it forever. Um, she has integrity. She truly cares and she's just really good at it. And so at Smart Marketer, I, recently in the last, I want to say, year, I kind of realized, man, we are falling behind on keeping our course up to date. We do other stuff, right? We've got our Zipify apps and our education on conversion optimization, yep. our Blue Ribbon Mastermind and email course and social course. But specifically, the, the, the paid ads training, I wasn't having the time to really do it. And so uh, Molly and I synced up and it just made sense for her to come in and kind of be our lead person who is uh, teaching that. And so, I mean, there's more there, but that's yeah. kind of that's a, how we got well. here. And, and just to add on to that, I think in terms of the format of the course, like you were saying, Eric, you know, Ezra really gave me the opportunity to build this the way I wanted. He was like, just kind of do it how you want. And um, that's not an opportunity I've had before. And I see a huge place in the market for more of a mentorship style experience for students versus a recorded class. People can go through a recorded class over and over again, but sometimes the dots just don't connect as to how that applies to their business. So doing this over 16 weeks, having a ton of access to me and the team, uh, that is it, that was exciting for me. And that's something that's worked really well uh, because I think people just get that extra a uh, bit of information or clarity that they just don't have from from other you know recorded classes. So that's why we chose to go about it that way, and I'm sure that's why you did uh, the same thing. The cohort is just such a powerful thing, like wait, because yeah. it's they're learning from you and they're learning from each other. It's being reinforced as they share results. I read a little bit a review of one of the courses, and I think it, you're in your weekly streams. You're actually taking you're kind of doing what you're going to do on stage in Barcelona. 
yeah. that you're taking feedback, you're looking at funnels, you're sort of giving live feedback to the whole group about individuals uh, ads, which is, it's just gonna, it's so much more valuable than just being able to go back to the same static document, you know? Yeah, like ad copy, for example, I'll teach ad copy and then they have a few days to write ads and then they're critiqued to the next week and they're critiqued throughout the, you know, the weeks that follow. But to see like Jay, for example, we just wrapped up class yesterday, one of our best students, his name's Jay. He, I critiqued his stuff probably 10 times and every time it was so much better. And imagine if he was still working with V1 nice. of, his, of his ads. So it's really like class or what you would experience, you know, in a good education system. And I haven't told you about this, Eric, so I'm, I'm hesitant to, to promise it in case it's not cool, but I have like, I could do it in two minutes. I've got some ad copy formulas that Molly and I revealed yes. for the first time at our $5,000 private boot camp event that before we do the Q and A and the critiquing in the hot seat on stage, I can quickly share those. I think people are gonna really like them. Love yeah, it. they're uh, awesome. The stage is yours. So uh, I'm excited to, uh, I just wanna be like a game show host up there. That's, that's my goal. Um, so, oh, that's, yeah, no, that's a really interesting approach. I, yeah, I totally agree about the cohorts. Um, the, the, the live feedback is, is so critical, but you know, there's so many different courses out there today that you just need to have that sort of like ongoing feedback. What, what sort of, uh, customers are, are, are taking the class? Is it, is it local businesses looking to, to spend a little bit? Is it, is it people all over the spectrum? Kind of all over, e right? Yeah. Well, so train by traffic person is the mentorship. And so that's mostly okay. e-com. I would say like 75% e-com. You know, a lot of those people have been following as, I would say the other 25% are in, there are definitely some info businesses in there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of more who I attract with my podcast. There are a, a good amount of people that work for someone else, which is cool uh, because I think my story very much aligns with those people and, and I can, you know, help them get, get more budget from their boss. Like that's a it's conversation a I was having yesterday. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then we do have some marketing agencies and maybe one or two local businesses. And then team traffic is the um, monthly virtual mastermind that we have for uh, advanced media buyers. And that's definitely e-com, a lot of marketing agencies that are servicing, you know, multiple clients at a time. Very cool. Well, you have to throw the links below. Uh, for anyone that might be interested in uh, in catching up with you both, let's talk a little bit about uh, you know what's going on in your mind right now regarding the height of conversion science. I was I did a little review of the course, and so I I see that, uh, and I'm really keen to talk to Ezra about uh, DPA and some of the uh, maybe a, a more advanced strategies for DPA. Uh, but Molly, to start with, I wanted to have this sort of discussion with you. But my, I have a friend who's who's I, I've mentioned him in the past couple podcasts. He's building out a brand. Uh, and he he had a funnel ready to go that was sort of like a, a very affiliate style funnel. It was a, a funnel where you step through slides. It's like a it's like a not exactly a, a news article or, or 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 something like that. He's tested that as well. But he's now started. He just worked on his page and his creative so much that he's getting similar results just by running to a product page. And he has this theory that if you're building a brand, you really need to be able to drive it to a product page. And I know that your strategy is different. I know that you that you have a much more sort of seg approach where you want to have a much more segmented funnel. Can you talk a little bit about about you know the benefits of of having that segmented funnel and whether it negatively impacts branding at all? Good question. I mean, first off, it depends. <laughs> Every situation is different. I think for you know for e-commerce, we actually recommend direct to product page. Ezra calls it the butter chicken. We can talk about that later. <laughs> the Bratislava butter chicken. People are coming up to me at our boot camp, like, okay, they've got their piece of paper. I'm doing the the because they they can't remember that part, but I'm doing the butter chicken. <laughs> Everyone loves butter chicken. That's what I'm saying. Always of works. Course. Simple, effective. <laughs> The rest yeah. of the product page is a butter chicken. Not it's too spicy. Chicken. Your kid will eat it. You know, <laughs> everybody thing. loves it. So for e-commerce, you can definitely get that to work. Um, I have a client that uh, last year we we no longer work together, but last year we were selling about five thousand notebooks a month via Facebook, just direct to product page, easy. 
When yeah. it comes to info, and probably when you've heard me speak more about needing content at the front of the funnel was um, more so directed at people selling information because a, a physical product is easy, easy to understand. Someone can imagine holding it in their hand. They know the problem it's gonna solve. It's, it's it, immediately, they're able to understand it and buy. With information, it's different. You need to build a relationship with the educator. You need to um, actually believe that they're going to help you. And so the need for a lead magnet or a webinar or you know, a Jeff Walker style mini class uh, you know, at the front end of your funnel is necessary. So, I mean, I think on both sides, branding is important and that's something Ezra is so good at, telling a story, creating a value set that customers um, or prospects align with that's important no matter what type yeah. of company metaphors He's of course of course but when it comes to buying traffic ecom you know direct a product page is where i would always start eventually you're going to need a pre-sell article uh for scale you know you you probably mm -hmm. hear us talk ab about that a lot with boom that's basically the play that that ezra's running now you know direct to to pre-sell article but he's very much saturated his market um so it really depends on the type of business i have a few things to add to that if i if i can yeah, i agree a hundred percent with everything molly says and i also want to point out price point as a factor in how yes. the length of a sales cycle you know the more expensive the item the high the longer the sales cycle if it's 50 bucks someone someone looks at a video oh sweet okay they go to a product page awesome look your product page has to be optimized for mobile lightweight fast loading images served up for whatever device it's on it's got to be optimized for desktop and tablet like yes you have to conversion optimize your product offer page but i will add that like if the product, if your average order value is over a hundred bucks, the sales cycle is longer. We, Molly and I sell everything from a $27 cosmetic stick all the way up to a $18,000 a year mastermind. And if you look at the length of the sales cycle on a higher ticket item, it's much longer. You get someone's email address, you talk to them, you communicate with them, you have pre-sale articles, you're educating and building relationship. And I would say over the hundred dollar average order value threshold is where you really want to start thinking about maybe even over the $85 that yeah. longer sales cycle. And the beauty of pre-sale articles is it gives you an additional way to um, create engagement, value, um, relationship, pixeled audiences. Like, yes, optimize your product offer page first. Go direct from video, add the product offer page first. But as soon as you have capacity, start working in pre-sales because you can use them in your automation sequences, abandoned cart, post-purchase, pre-purchase. You can use them to mail your list when you're just doing broadcast promotions. You can use them in product launches. You can use them from ads. Like, they yeah. are only beneficial to your overall marketing and sales process and you got to figure them out at some point and if you elongate that sales process uh it's going to help you in the long run even if you have a impulse buy low ticket item we recommend going direct to product offer page first get that down especially for lower price products but uh the pre-sale strategy is the only thing it's like our shtick is what we use this is what this is what brought us to the dance and we will ride it until it doesn't work anymore and it's still working. So I And is it always changing? It. Is the pre-sell are the tactics, not the tactics, but the approach, the strategy within the pre-sell pre always We a ton of different styles changing. of pre-sell. And we're constantly optimizing our pre-sell page. Like for example, uh, I can't, can I share my screen? Does that um, work here? I don't know. I don't. I know I can. If can I just put you solo for a sec. Share? No, you're solo. Okay. okay. I don't know if I can. I can only, sh I think I can only share mine. I think I can share my screen. Do it. Let's take a look. Let's see. Let's see how this works. Um, camera, microphone, manage. All right. This ah, is maybe not. As <laughs> the fire phone, everyone. Uh, just go solo. Yes. Okay. You're now always optimizing the layout of your pre-sale article. Like we've found that a sticky header stuck to the top uh, that has two calls to action in it: one to view the products and one to join your email list gets you 100% more people to the product page and 35, maybe it's 300% more email addresses, either 30 or 300, but it's a lot more. And um, on mobile, it's stuck there and then they scroll and it goes away. But as soon as they show upward intent, as soon as they begin to scroll back up, it drops down with both of those buttons. So it's uh, 
So as soon as someone begins to scroll up on mobile, they're showing the intent of not being interested. You drop that header down because they want to go somewhere else. And it's got those two calls to action. And so, yeah, we're optimizing the pre-sales. We're writing pre-sales that are focused on individual products. We're writing pre-sales that are folk called listicles that are tips based. We're writing pre-sales, all kinds of pre-sales, but you only need one. You start with one good one that uh, pre-sells your entire brand. Uh, that you can then link to, to your your product lineup from or an individual product for and then yeah you add on more but I have a one pre-sell article that 95% of my cold traffic goes to that I wrote myself at the end of 2014 that we have never beaten and we have been trying so sometimes it, it took me like a year and a half two years to get to this pre-sell but I wrote it and to this day uh, we've spent well over 15 million dollars in ads directly to this article and it's still the winner. And uh, it's our, been our goal for years to beat this thing. We can't do it. So that, that reminds me when I was back in the day uh, as an affiliate network on Germany, we had the exclusive on Groupon Germany. We just kept trying to beat the burger. There's this one burger that was in the Groupon image ad and we couldn't beat the burger. But yours, so why do you think it, why do you think it stood the test of time? Just because you wrote it from the top of your head, I, from your heart I, kind of thing. I wrote just, something that, just, look, here's the deal. Group of people, collective experience, you, that's, this is what your business does. Your business talks to a group of people who are sharing a collective experience. Women over 50 who are aging and society is telling them that is bad. Your job is to use content, videos and articles and text and images to engage that group around the topic of that experience that they're having and get them interested and, and then get them interested in your products. And, we just hit the nail on the head, it, you know? And to and this is what, one thing I took from your training that, that is that is just obvious, but it's great to hear it put this way. Each thing has its own purpose. You're not trying to do everything with every piece. You, and, and when you write a pre-sell or when you do a sales page or whatever you're doing, you, you want it to, to you, you're not trying to, you know, you're trying to get them to the next page or you're trying to get them to do something on that page or just having very clear goals yeah, about the, each The pre-sell is designed to get them interested in potentially buying to share content that they will find valuable about an experience that they are having and to introduce the product lineup. It's not to sell the product. It's to just ping their interest and be like, oh, this is cool, this oh, this for these products. And then if they click through, sweet, now you're selling them. Or if they don't, you're retargeting them. Totally. Uh, very cool. There's one other like technical thing I wanna cover here just for my own elucidation. Uh, we've just way too late in the game elucidation just that down that's, right a, that's now. a big that word i'm from word. kentucky i can't handle I'm that from I grew up in Hawaii. <laughs> worst, worst school system in every i think when i was growing up it was like 50 at number 50 out of 50 states in uh, terms of school systems so we don't know about elucidation yeah it sounds like uh, hallucination i, mean, I have <laughs> I, I have hallucinations i have a robust vocabulary so we discussed the we're, origin we're of impressed yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. That's what I well, try with all my words. Big word. I, I, know, I have the best words, like Trump. So, uh, no. you're, you're, that, that's not thanks. a good comparison. <laughs> no. Oh, geez. Here we go. Uh, no. Uh, so, I want to talk about DPA because we just started what, like over like three months ago. We just started running DPAs for some reason. We just started, uh, and they've been doing the best of any of our ads. They have the highest ROI. They're just they're they're, they're so simple to the point. Um, but we're only running them like just straight. We're only just running them, uh, you know, if you went to the page, you get an ad with with that, you know, card essentially. What are some sort of more advanced tactics for using DPA uh, more effectively? Like in, maybe in terms of discounts or like how do you layer DPAs the most effectively? So is everyone, do you think everyone's familiar with what a DPA is? Let's back it up a little. Okay, because let me explain this because I think people get a little confused by this. Am I... Am I uh, slow or is it my, my video is moving slow for me? Are you guys have me here? No, you look good. Yeah, your, it's, your voice it's is good. Okay. So a dynamic product ad is a carousel ad unit that is filled with products that a user has seen. So a user goes, they visit your products. You can then have an ad on Facebook that will fill a carousel, which is a scrolling thing of squares with those products that they saw. That is dynamic product ads. Now, the way that dynamic product ads function is they leverage something called the Facebook catalog. The Facebook product catalog connects to your store and pulls in all your products so that you can then display those products in advertisements. The Facebook product catalog will allow you to create what are known as product sets. Those are sets 
of different products. Think of them as, you know, collections of products, bestsellers, you know, uh, different types of products, skincare, makeup. Okay. Now, the dynamic part of these product ads is when someone visits a product and you can dynamically show it to them on Facebook. An even better way to use these is higher up in the funnel where it's literally just a product that is uh, an ad that is um, populated with a set of products that you've chosen, your most popular ones. You can on Facebook also create what's called an intro card. That intro card is a card that sits at the front of this carousel of products. It can be a one minute video. It can be a moving GIF animation. It can be a static image. So we use an intro card and we're usually using videos or GIFs in that intro card. We also have sales copy above that product carousel. And we are using these product carousel ads, both dynamic and non-dynamic. We're using them at the top of the funnel for awareness. Uh, and we are doing uh, the, the pro it's a product catalog sales objective inside of Facebook. And Facebook knows who is most likely to use their, their, um, their platform like a shopping engine and be interested in products. So if you run top line awareness advertising, leveraging the conversion objective, like add to cart or conversion events with video ads direct to your product offer page, and then you run on top of that at a smaller budget, carousel ads using the, the product catalog sales objective, filling it with your best sellers, you will reach those people more times because Facebook only has so much allocation for conversion ads, which is why you wanna be running different types of objectives, including product catalog sales at the top of the funnel. Now, once someone visits a product, yes, dynamic product ads to retarget them, but also dynamic product ads to retarget people who visited the cart and didn't buy. Dynamic product mm -hmm. ads to cross sell someone who bought one product and not another. Think of them as another ad unit that should be being leveraged at every layer of your ad strategy, not just in the retargeting for people who visit the products, but on awareness, on retargeting at every step, on loyalty, for sale events. It's a placement, it's, a, it's an ad unit that is a powerful ad unit that's gonna get visibility into the newsfeed when your conversion ads maybe won't get visibility. So if you wanna reach everyone in your target groups, have additional object campaigns with different objectives targeting the same groups of people. Of course, 80% of your advertising is gonna be conversion objective focused, but we're running messenger, we're running video views, we're running product catalog sales. We're out there running because we right. want to reach people and we know that um, that the more objectives that we have, the more likely our ads are to get in front of those users who uh, Facebook is limiting the number of conversion ads those people are going to see. That's an interesting, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I'm going to set up those ads this afternoon, first of all, to the top of funnel, which we hadn't been doing. Uh, and we have lots of that content. I think that could be absolutely huge for this strategy. It's, it's Eric, also just, yeah, go ahead, Molly. Sorry, really quick, something like a good way to think about this too, um, most people here know that there's a behavior that you can target called engaged shoppers. And so those are people that Facebook knows buy stuff from stores online that have the Facebook pixel. But the issue with that targeting option is that it's super expensive because every advertiser wants to go in there. And of course you want to target engaged shoppers, no matter what your business is. So the CPMs are very, very high. So when you think about using catalog sales, right, with conversions, with video views, other objectives, it's actually allowing you to reach those people that are engaged shoppers without paying the high CPMs that people are paying when they're using that targeting option, but with another objective. So, but when it comes to scale, you know, you're not hearing Ezra saying like 50% of my cold traffic budget is catalog sales, right? I mean, it's it's going to work to a certain extent. I wouldn't look at it as like the most scalable objective on the planet, but understand the opportunity there that by using that objective, you're able to reach that audience um, without the traditional uh, targeting of engaged shoppers that most of us used to use. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I think with DPAs, they're, you know, the functionality of them are cool. They're very simple, but the biggest benefit is that you are using a different objective than just the conversion objective, which every other person is using um, that, that you're competing against in the auction. Totally. And same thing uh, with messages, right? Like I know with Boom, for two days after you, or after you add something to cart, but don't purchase, 
after two days for the next 28 days, you see a messenger ad in your newsfeed for 10% off, you know, click to get the coupon in messenger, then click over to the product page. The a reason that that works so well is that not many people are using the messages objective. And so there's a ton of inventory there that's much cheaper than the conversion objective. And it just, you just have, I was going to say another giant, I was going to say it behooves you to, uh, <laughs> to, 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 to just complete the picture. It behooves you to, yeah, to, to, to complete the full picture of it. Cause Facebook wants you to use all these, all these different tools that they've built also. So they keep those channels open for, for you to exploit, which is thanks Facebook. Uh, what about dynamic ads? What about the, like, uh, the, just basically entering a bunch of headlines, a bunch of images. Are you both exploiting that feature to its fullest? You mean I, uh, like the split testing of a bunch of different assets, like where you put in yeah. a bunch of different, uh, yeah. It's I, called dynamic ads, right? Yeah. Dynamic creatives, I think is dynamic what they're calling it. Right. Yeah. But, so I've tried it a few times. My biggest thing is that you, it's really hard to maintain social proof, right? Like you're not just launching four ads in an ad set where you can take those post IDs and use them in other ad sets. We all know how important social proof is. Uh, today more than ever on Facebook. So I think it's good for testing, but if you're wanting to scale something, um, that the, the lack of ability to really snowball that social proof is a huge issue for me. But I have noticed, and I've heard from students and some friends that we, we all know anytime Facebook launches something newer, they want to give it a bit of momentum or it's going to be cheaper. So I do think there's some opportunity there right now because Facebook's really trying to push it. Uh, but personally, I'm not using it. Um, I don't know about you guys as I haven't talked to Boris about that either, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens with it. Uh, well, here, I mean, I have some thoughts on it. I agree with you. I also feel like, um, Look, every feature in there, there's going to be some people using with some level of positive effect. Mm -hmm. We have tried it several times and never had it perform better than our deliberately written specific ads where we've got a headline that matches an image or a video that matches a, t a, a set of body cop text copy that matches a call. Like We are good at writing ads, and so the ones that we're writing, while they, so yes, they do also maintain social proof, which is much better, they just work better than yeah. Facebook trying to mix something together to find out what works. It's like, I feel like the, that like, yes, I, I am Mr. Split test guy. So I'm with you. Let's test everything available. But it's also like, how far are we going to take this? You know? Yeah. Yes. I want to split test ads and we'll put a couple ads in there and we'll just test different copy. But so far we have not found results with that algorithm. Now maybe it just takes, maybe it's just not quite there yet. Like, uh, it was something else. I can't remember it off the top of my head that was not very good when they rolled it out and then got very good later. Yeah. So this could be one of those. Yeah. And I think it's also like, that's such a good point, Ezra. I think that's sort of the type of marketers we are. Like we know that the message and the experience of the ad is so much more important than, you know, split testing a hundred different creatives against one another. And that's honestly like a big mistake Facebook marketers are making nowadays because you used to be able to do that or even maybe need to do that because the environment was different. I mean, online uh, buying or consumer behavior is very similar now to how humans interact in person because mm -hmm. most of us are living a big portion of our lives online. And so like Ezra said, we, int you know, I intentionally write ad copy to match a creative. I don't want to test that against, you know, uh, um, uh, an experience that might be more feelings based when I'm going more for, um, you know, speaking to a pain point that they have. Um, so, you know, that's, that's such a good point. That congruency in the ad from copy to creative is more important to me than split testing the colors of the background or whatever people are split testing nowadays. I like this. I got a couple of like, like old school media buyers, right? Like, because there's this idea that it's like analog versus digital. You're like, if, you know, if, if we just split up everything into a million little pieces, the grand AI will figure it all, all out for us. Whereas Ezra's still rocking the same text he wrote in 2014. Well, I mean, uh, look, you you know. I'm, not, I'm not saying you don't got to write new articles. No. <laughs> yeah, we don't happen to have a winning oh, one yeah. that is just performed. And look, most people, I'm, this is a misconception amongst a lot of business owners. 
Most people who scale get to the dance on one thing. Dollar Shave Club's fancy video. Yeah, they had it. Look, you got to have it all. They had good automation sequences. They had an incredible product. They had optimized conversion process. Sure. But what, they had that thing that brought them to the dance. The Amazon business owners are getting their, their scale through the free Amazon traffic. There's people who hit a piece of press who got their initial real jump from that press. There's folks who got like a fancy influencer. They got onto Joe Rogan and that was that. Like usually a brand has one thing, search engine optimization or Google AdWords, or there's like one core driver of visibility or conversion that really does it for them. And then they supplement with like really phenomenal and as good as they can get in every other area. But it generally, there generally is when you look at a brand at scale, that kind of like one thing you can trace it back to that really pushed them over the edge. That's a cool, yeah, no, that's a very interesting perspective. Okay, one more specific question about a, about a tech issue and then we'll get into the FOMO generation portion of the episode. Uh, what would just CBA, CBO, yay or nay? Are you, are you rock? Are you loving the CBO? Are you avoid? Yeah. Are you dreading the day that it takes over or what? No, CBO is wonderful. It just has to be used in context. So, you know, how the process I use and, and teach students is anytime you are testing something new, a new author, a completely new avatar, a new pre-sale article, still use budgets at the ad set level because you want that control. You want to see which audiences are working, but when it's time for scale, CBO is absolutely the way to go. Um, you just have to use less ad sets, no more than five ad sets, much larger audience sizes. I mean, I use anywhere from 50 to 60 million in each ad set, which two years ago, I would have never have done that. Um, but CBO, it is built to get you a high volume of results very quickly. It is built for a very different reason than setting bud budgets at the ad set level. And I wouldn't be surprised if Facebook decides not to make the switch in September to go all in. You know, I've given, it's the same thing with like the messenger stuff last year where they were going to uh, require everyone to apply to for subscription broadcast messaging, which is going to uh, into effect at the end of this month. But I was working with Minichat at the time, and we told Facebook, "Hey guys, marketers will quit using this if you if you do this." And mm -hmm. um, you know, they extended that timeline. So I think that. Facebook understands that um, they can't go all in on CBO because there's really not a great way to test. Um, but anyways, that's that's my thinking. Mm -hmm. I love CBO, but you have to have an offer that's already working. You have to be using ads with a lot of social proof. You've got to really know your audience. You've got to broaden out um, those uh, those audience sizes must be larger um, and you have to be ready to scale and not necessarily in test mode. Um, and Ezra, this was something I was talking to Boris, the, the CMO of, of um, Boom yesterday. And Boris has seen the same thing. You know, He's going back to some budgets at the ad set level because he realizes he needs that? to do some new testing with some new pre-sale articles, actually, <laughs> that you guys are launching yeah. this month. But when you go to we scale, I mean, CBO is why you got a big reason you guys had your biggest January ever for Boom. Biggest January of all time. All we time. spent uh, 555000 in January. I don't know if it was our biggest spend month, but it was our definitely no, our biggest, your biggest month revenue. Month. Yeah. yeah. But um, uh, yeah, we, we were just having this conversation uh, maybe a week ago too, where we looked at it and we thought, you know what? We love CBO, but like we're going to have to switch back for a couple of things. So uh, I agree with what Molly said. Nice. Okay. We covered it. Now on to the FOMO portion. So obviously, if you're not going to join us in Barcelona, you got to just be, you know, at this point, just questioning your decisions. If you go to iStack.link iStack .link slash ad buyers, you scroll down to the speaker section, there's a little button that sort of says, if I can share my desktop screen, it, it just, go. Oh, I've got to add a Chrome extension. No, forget it. Okay, we'll just go to the website and apply now for Ezra and Molly's amazing hot seat. We've got about 30 applications so far. So I'll start, we can start the digging into those and figuring uh, a few of the of the best ones that we can discuss on stage. But we have also just re revealed that you're gonna get these amazing copywriting scripts um, from Ezra and Molly, and you're gonna get to, to watch them. Just, you know, wh what's his name? What's the chef, the really evil chef? You guys are just gonna tear into people, right? Uh, uh, Gordon Ramsay, Bobby Flay. 
Bobby Flay, it's Ramsey. Uh, Ramsey's the, the a hole. Is it, it um, uh, Emeril Lagasse? Bam! <laughs> Bam! <laughs> Aria Batali, Rachel Ray. You know them all. Top Chef's the Dude, best show, right? We know I, that. I, I had a stint about 10 years ago. I was living with uh, my late co founder, Cindy Joseph, in Yonkers, New York, about an hour and a half away. And we went, she had a cable box. I didn't have a cable box where I had lived before that. She, she, we went in on the Food Network. So I was it for a season or two there. I was really into you it. You could have your own show. I think you, you should. You know when should, this like, was? I, think you can. I can date you exactly when this was. This was the very year that Guy Fieri won America's Next Top Chef. Is that what it was? Or America's Next Food Network Star. That uh, one, yeah. Now look at him. He look won him. that the year that I uh, made my sort of, uh, my rookie year in the Food Network consumption game. Uh, <laughs> and now he's and a god of At least head. 10 years ago. It was at least 10 years ago. But I stopped consuming all that stuff pretty shortly thereafter. But I spent a season in it. Sorry, I'm wasting the podcast. What are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to, you're going to be able to have conversations with Ezra about this, this kind of thing on stage. No, it'll be even more valuable. Like if you, you'll see, we ask some basic questions. We're going to actually get in touch with people a little bit more closely so we can actually review maybe some of their ads or some parts of their funnels, but it's going to be a really innovative and sort of valuable experience for anyone in the audience or anyone who's brave enough to join us on stage. Uh, what this is, this, will this be your first time to Barcelona, both of you or? Yes. Very I cool. went to, um, I went to the Island over there. Um, Mallorca once. Oh yeah. That was fun. Mallorca. The greatest awesome. hotel in the world is in Mallorca. It's called Cap Rocat. And these hotel rooms are like drilled into the side of these cliffs. Whoa. Pretty cool. Nice. Game well, trip. we're going to have mad adventures uh, mm -hmm. on the Barcelona, you know, Rambla. So I'm bringing my you. dog. He's you making his dog coming kind of, over. Kind of dog? <laughs> he's a little, little chihuahua. One. Little oh, guy. Cute. Nice. Okay, cool. I'll leave my dog at home because he's a menace. But uh, thank you both for coming on with me today. And so everyone go to ad, istack.link slash ad buyers right now. You can get 25% off with a special ad leaks promo code. If you're not part of ad leaks, you got to join up. Best things happen there. Uh, all right. Thank Would you, you let both. Me do a pitch real quick, real quick. Yes, before please. You end, let me pitch please. this event for you. Okay. Listen, person okay. who is watching this, thank you for watching. We really appreciate your time. I'm just going to um, go solo here. Anytime that you uh, decide that you're going to spend your time, which I think is your greatest asset is the time that you have with me and with Molly and with iStack. We're going to do everything in our power to make sure that you get value. If you are on the fence about this event, you've got to remember that in your daily life, you have the routine and stimulation of your daily life. You've got to take out the trash and you got to pick up the kids and you got to feed the dog. And when you take all of your attention and you put it on the growth of your business, with a group of people who are also doing that over the course of a couple of days, you can see crazy jumps forward. Every major leap forward in my business has come from some form of live event where I met someone, where I made a relationship, where I got a strategy. So it is well worth your time and money. I had a friend who lives in um, Toronto or Montreal. He lives somewhere, somewhere in Canada, Montreal. He lives in Montreal. And he texted me and said, hey, man, I'm on the fence about this event. What do you think? And I told him the same thing and said, you know what? I'm coming. So it's, it's worth it to make that investment in yourself, your knowledge, your network, your business. And also, you, there's not many opportunities for Molly and I to look at your stuff and tell you what we think you should do. That is, in my opinion, priceless, right? I've been in this game forever. Molly has been in this game forever. We run, operate, build businesses. We know how to do this stuff. We can help you. Join us in Barcelona. It's going to be fun. Perfecto. Amazing. Not to put you on the spot, Molly, but any final words? Just, just come on. Uh, I, I think everything's been said. I appreciate you having us on. And even, I think what's cool about, and we talked about this earlier with the mentorship idea, teaching live classes. Even if your business isn't picked for us to critique, you will learn so much sitting in the audience. Um, because I, 
I think practical application is what's needed most in the marketing education space right now. And just to see us give feedback on an actual business and what they're doing with their ads and certain blocks that they might that they have that you might also have. Um, as Ezra said, I, I think that's priceless. And we'll be in Barcelona. Um, I also have a lot of friends who have purchase tickets that didn't even know Ezra and I were going to be there. People that um, are, are really coming up in the game. So I know that despite, you know, not despite, uh, in, in, <laughs> there will be awesome content, but there will also be amazing people. Um, and you never know who you're going to meet that they can help your business or you could help theirs. Yeah, exactly. And this goes to what we were talking about earlier. Well, we'll like a finely tied bow, uh, you know, your, your course, which you're offering, which you can drop links below. Uh, is 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 that cohort based feeling? You get the same thing condensed at an event where you're with all the same people on the same vibes. You're meeting with them. You're talking with them. Uh, it's a real come join us for a cohort in Barcelona. And thank you both. We will see you in Europe. I stack training. All oh. right. See y'all there. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>